to the inner voice. Welcome to the one within all to the Interverse podcast. I'm your host, Chance, and it is good to be back on this particular show. Been a little bit of a break, kind of unintentional, but hey, that's the flow of life. And that just means the excitement for this conversation is really built up an awesome, awesome potential for beautiful flow state with my great new friend, James from Family Fun Guy. James is uh, l- definitely a family man. <laughs> <laughs> I got to meet him and his beautiful wife and children over at the Bertaria National Festival. Really, really good time. And I learned quite a bit from James about his practice with uh, culturing fungi, right? And also just the medicinal use of mushrooms is a big part of the conversation that's going to be on the topic table today. There's so much. I mean, these particular life forms are for as for as well understood as they are, there's probably so much more that we could learn about how they actually uh, reflect the fractal of the entire network of life force energy across the fractal of this realm. Really excited to get into all that. Yeah, and we'll be talking later down the road to James' wife, Elise, about some topics in the subjects of birth and sovereignty. That's going to be a lot of fun. Would love to have them both on at the same time, but getting them one-on-one is another kind of flow, and that's going to be fun. They've got a you know, swap off to take care of their kids. They're doing the most rebellious and sovereign oriented thing that one can do or a family can do, which is to have children and grow your own food. (laughs) And as far as solutions go, that's the one that we're probably going to be continually preaching on this podcast for years to come, because it's only going to become more and more important as the old systems crumble as a way for us to be shown into the light of our actual birthright being connected with nature, understanding nature, working with nature. And we have brother nature bear here today. I mean, that's his bear name. So <laughs> we're going to have a really good time. You guys can check him out at familyfungi.net or family fun guy on Instagram, both good places to catch up with their products and watch the videos that he puts on Instagram. He does a lot of teaching through that platform as well. And I'm just really excited to get into it. James is a highly spiritual dude. We could discuss all kinds of range of subjects. I know that he's done a lot of the deep work on himself to bring, bring, about, bring about a higher level of consciousness for himself and then thus show that to the world. So let's get into it with the uh, mycological maestro himself, James, Brother Nature Bear. Welcome to the show, my man. Dude, you have a gift with words. Thanks so much, Chance. That's a terrific introduction, brother. Um, I do yeah, my best. So, my brain's a little scrambled with uh, mucus today. And so, <laughs> yeah, dude, get the funk out, you know? <laughs> um, so we're based out of uh, Southern Louisiana and we've both lived here our whole lives. Uh, we always kind of get it, get comments whenever we travel. You don't have an accent. Uh, I was homeschooled for the first portion of my life until eighth grade. And my mom put my sister and I, uh, she's a, a year older than I am, my sister. And she put us into high school and middle school separately so that we could have the experience, which, you know, not so great, honestly, because it put a damper on our ability to learn. Because before, whenever we were being homeschooled, it was kind of like open, you can learn whatever you're interested in. And we didn't get access to the internet in our home until I was probably like 14 or 15. So it, it was really interesting. Like I spent a lot of time at libraries. I spent a lot of time 
in museums. Uh, I spent a lot of time looking at source documents too. And it was, so I was an autodidact from a very young age and teaching myself and learning from experience and mistakes and finding that experience is the best teacher. And it was, a, it was a pivotal point whenever I started to reflect on the change that happened going from homeschooling into the public school system, that it felt like there was a ceiling placed over my ability to learn. Not, not necessarily the ability, but in, in the amount of information that was accessible or that was, uh, that, that was seen as acceptable to be, to be discussing, like it, it could easily be dismissed that certain levels of information weren't worth studying. Cause it wasn't going to be on the test, man. Like, why would you worry about it? Like, that's not what we're getting tested on. And big difference still, between curiosity driven investigation and forced memorization. A hundred percent. And I saw it in my peers who had been in school for their entire life in the public school system. And we had different approaches to problem solving and different approaches to investigation. And uh, it's, it's odd to see that homeschooling whenever I was growing up was demonized. And now ever, a lot of people who are like, okay, well, that's clearly the way forward. If you want your children to have their thinking faculties, their reasoning faculties in, in order and not disjointed. I mean, it's, it's like we've, we've been removed from our natural inclination to reason things out for ourselves and problem solve, and that it's been replaced with this synthetic, um, this, this synthetic knowledge that doesn't really know very much. Like we start to, this is, this is one of the things that got me out of college was that I started to investigate how much we know and seeing that it was very, very flimsy. And that it's more that we, we're going to continue looking at a particular subject and it's going to keep unfolding. It's not settled. The science isn't settled. Nothing's settled. Um, it, is, it is dynamic. You can find a new perception of that information if you work with it long enough. But if you just take it at face value and be like, well, that's it. It's clear cut. It's, it's done. Then that that almost subdues your inner child and your inner curiosity to not have that natural, that natural innocent inclination to go and, and study. Um, and so I lived my whole life here and I graduated high school. Then I went to college to start studying nursing. And then I figured out that that's not really what I wanted to do. So I switched to uh, micro molecular biology and I got really into it. I got really into um, the, the science of microbes, the science in soil, the science of the health of our bodies. But it was all, it was all void, materialistic and mechanistic. Um, it, it didn't seem to account for the human organism, the, the, pers the, the people, the people that are here, like whatever terminology you want to use, I, I get caught up because I have studied legal fictions and studied all of this information as well. And so I'm trying to be careful with the language that I'm choosing to convey the message. However, we, we've, we found ourselves at this point where a lot of people are, are, are starting to look back over their shoulder as they're seeing society crumble and they're going, wait, what have we been missing out on? And, and they're not seeing their families that are, that are right next to them. People had their loved ones die in a hospital alone. There's no chance that I would ever allow that to happen to my family. Because I understand that that is the, the greatest gift that I've been given is, is to be a father and to have my family at all, to have this life at all and be endowed with consciousness at all. There, there's your point of gratitude to start from for the day is it, just be grateful to be here. Any day that you're on this side of the soil, it's a good day. <laughs> it, it's a it's a great day to. Uh, I like to, how you put paint. that. This <laughs> side of the soil. Yeah, man. I got. I, there's a lot of old folks that come to the farmers market where we sell our fresh edible mushrooms, which is what most of our production space is for. Um, there's also this tent back here. This little black guy back here. 
is full of our medicinal mushrooms. Um, but I talk to these older folks at the, uh, at the farmer's market and they'll have a mask on and they'll be trying to talk to me about this. And uh, you saw our tent whenever we were at the festival, our logo and our motto is on our tent and it says, your health is true wealth. And these people are looking at me <laughs> with a mask on trying to have a conversation with me. And there's still this, there's still this, uh, this ravine between our understanding one another. And I'm trying to connect with them. And they're like, you know, they'll walk up kind of gruff and kind of tired for, for whatever reason. And they're like, yeah, how's your day going? And I'm like, oh, great. Any day that I'm on this side of the soil is a great day. And you, you see like that moment of realization spark and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah, cool. And, and I start talking to them about mushrooms, about how edible mushrooms have their own medicinal capacities. They have these complex carbohydrates that are called beta glucans that help to feed your probiotic microbiome. And so our, uh, as I was saying in our uh, vibrant the other evening was that your microbiome isn't just relegated to your gut. It's, it's spread throughout your tissues. It's spread throughout your body. Like we are a host, but it's not in the sense of like uh, parasitism and like these things are just trying to get, get over on us. Um, that, that sort of parasitic mentality comes about through our diet and how we're feeding our microbiome. But these mushrooms have these great compounds that are excellent for detoxifying. Some beta glucans are great for engaging your lymphatic system and helping with lymphatic drainage. So I always encourage people to eat, consume mushrooms, especially what is in your area, because it's breathing the same air that you're breathing. It's getting the same water and it's in the same time that you are. You're under the same cycles of the moon. You're under the same cycles of the sun. You are in the groove. And so whenever you find a mushroom in nature, it is an ephemeral representation of the microbiome of that part of your ecosystem. And it's not going to be there for a couple of days. Like it, it will only be there for a couple of days is, is the accurate way of saying that. Because if you're there at the perfect time to pick it, it's telling you to pick it. It's, it's saying, Hey, like I've dropped my spores already. And like either, either you're going to eat me or bugs are going to eat me. And if you have the uh, intuition to make that connection with it, then you can use that for food and medicine and all of the things that our ancestors knew intuitively, we can start to reconnect with that because we have been indoctrinated into this materialistic, mechanistic, stepwise um, way of looking at things. But sometimes, and you'll notice this whenever you start studying anything esoteric or anything in the occult, is that sometimes you get a piece of information you have no idea what it's there for. It's just a data point that's lingering and lingering until, boop, oh, wait, there's two data points and now they're in relationship, but there's no line between them. But I see two data points and then something connects the dots and it may be five years until it happens. But that data point would just be hanging out for that connection, for that, for that neural connection, for that microbiota connection, for that synergy to establish itself. We just have to get out of the way, man. Like we're putting ourselves in the way of our own greater understanding of our bodies because we're looking at it like it's something that can be pieced and parted and then uh, put back together. The, the whole is not the sum of its parts. We're not gonna, we're not gonna blast uh, subatomic particles uh, at one another to find God or find the hand of God in there. Like if you want to find the hand of God, take a deep breath. <laughs> like it's, or just it, like, it's, uh, look at your hand. The logos is in your hand. Marty Leeds does all the number stuff on that. But sorry, yeah. continue. I've been no, holding back great, so many things I want point. to interject. I love what you're saying. So go ahead. And, and it's a great point. Like uh, Topher at the festival was talking about Phi. And Phi is already there in your hand. Like we're, we already carry it with us. Um, and I'm... I was, I'm still a young guy. And while I was young, I got tattoos to remind myself of the things that are already encoded in my body, which is funny. Um, yeah, me too. And, I have a few, but, uh, you know, they work for me. Yeah. Not enough yeah, to block exactly. the sun too much. 
<laughs> That's right. Um, and so we, we start, we get presented with this, uh, with this solution at some point, because I have a lot of people coming to me about their problems, the problems with their health. And I'm not a doctor, but I do read a lot. And I try to coach people on reading for themselves because I'm not trying to sell anyone on anything. All of this stuff exists in nature. I'm just trying to make it more available for people in my, in my area, in my community. Uh, however, that seems to parse itself out. I want there to be the availability for turkey, people to get turkey tail or reishi or lion's mane or just oyster mushrooms. If people aren't going to be out in the world looking for these things and looking to form a relationship, then they'll miss it and they'll miss their chance to heal themselves in their appropriate time. And so I have people coming to me looking for a solution and it's always about forming a relationship back with themselves. Your, your body, your vessel is the, the semi-permeable membrane of your experience from the spiritual into the physical. And your body is that medium that is in between the spirit and the world. And you clean that, you clean your filters. Like if you don't clean your water filter, like your, the water either doesn't filter well enough or you're not getting as clean of water as you think you are. You have to clean your filter so that you can better take in the light of the creator, the waters, the minerals, the, the, the earth and the air and the ether, like you have to have all, all five, all five elements have to come into our being to bring about that layer of health. And if we're only looking at our bodies mechanistically, one, ether goes out the window, two, breath goes out the window almost, almost as quickly as ether. And then it comes down to, well, what are you eating? What are you drinking? What, what's, what, what are those things constituted? But the, the mechanistic materialistic way has removed the spirit from man, but only in a conceptual basis. So that concept is the intermediary between us and the creator, because we have turned, we, we have uh, turned ourselves away from the light of the creator to look at the reflection of the light of the creator. You know, the irony of that too, is the, whole idea of ether and spirit is itself conceptual. And I mean that in a hermetic like mind way, mm -hmm. a lot of the problems with ether in terms of how it's described is I think that it requires to be understood in the like Google, Google search definition of what ether is supposed to be requires the atomistic view in the first place. Cause they're like, well, this light, these photons, light has photons in their particles and it has to have a medium to travel through. But how I see it after the work I've done with people in sound and remotely, like all of this stuff is conceptual distance, mm -hmm. separation, space, all of it. And I don't mean like fake, but I mean mental mm -hmm. and that the bar the irony of the barrier between us and spirit that humanity has erected is that that's also conceptual. Mm -hmm. So like the power of the mind and of belief is incredible. And uh, there's a lot of, a lot of directions I'd like to put point you in, but the first is just like this theme of, of how you noticed at a young age, the way that learning was being entrained as a deferring to authority rather than finding out for yourself. And there's no, there's no real learning in deferring to authority. It is rampant across the entire society, whether it's like in academia or in morality. Like there's no value in my opinion, in a morality that is a deference to authorities uh, say so of what is right and wrong because you don't actually know what's right and wrong then, but you do know what's right and wrong. The only thing is this conceptual barrier between you and giving yourself the uh, allowance to know for yourself, <laughs> giving yourself like the, the looking within point of what does my conscience say that we are all born with? We all have that. So, yeah. and so that, that touches on what I was, what I was speaking about a, a couple minutes ago, which is experience is the best teacher. Like we have these concepts, but, how do you know that you're, uh, how do you know that you're in prison until you touch the walls? Unless you know the boundary condition of your experience, then you're, you're only taking things on faith. There's nothing wrong with taking things on faith, but experience 
puts it into your being as irrefutable. And you can find that you can connect with that. That's what the, the saints, the yogis, the, um, people that started a lineage of meditation uh, of a meditative practice, that person that started the lineage, they just sat down long enough to clear themselves out enough so that they could hear the message. And the, the message is ultimately one of non-duality or monotheism. You can look at it either way. Non-dual means that there's only one. Monotheism means there's, there's only one. There's a prime cause. And you can reason this out or you can look at the hermetic principles and you can go, oh, there has to be a primal cause to make all of these principles emerge. There has to be something, right? And so for a lot of people, the faith-based part of it is inferring the something, is inferring the presence of a creator, inferring that there is God. And then there is the direct experience where whenever you inspire whenever you breathe in you are taking life into you but whenever you are inspired life breathes you awake and so it's a it's a bit of a semantic leap to go from um just just trying to get the next breath to being given the next breath each or not even trying and just being on this autopilot of yeah you know automatic respiration right and and then just observe that because that that's where your experience and your intuition is going to start teaching you the most is you see what your autopilot does whenever you may be kind of mentally off in your own fantasy well i thought about this too let me point out that during cooties when they're putting so many people on respirators and that was just killing people left and right obviously horrible I realized that what you're saying is absolutely true. Those who are on the automatic breathing most of the time or all the time, and none of us are perfect at taking a conscious breath for every breath. It's okay. (laughs) But when you're permanently on the respirator, (laughs) not even necessarily on the physical respirator, but what is happening to those people who in the hospital were put on that? They're put on the respirator and they're basically waiting to die. And that's kind of like what life becomes when you, remove the conscious choice and will of and the gratitude of being conscious of and aware of that inspiration that comes with each breath that each breath is like breath is the prayer you know so yeah. are, are we waiting to die and just like on this automatic respiration so uh, I don't, is our body a machine that does this work for us or are we as living men and women taking responsibility for our connection to divine through the breath So I kind of want to take it from there and work with you on this concept that I've been parsing out. And so like you're saying with the respirator, these people basically got dialed into uh, numbers. They got put back into a very conceptual realm where it is, you need X number of breaths per minute to have a certain uh, oxygen, uh, blood oxygen saturation. And that not everyone needs the same thing. And yeah, they're, they're going to have formulas and all of this to determine the best amount for each person. But that's, it's still more nuanced than that. We're not that mechanistic, man. We're not, uh, we're not, a, we're not a, a Ford engine that can, you can calibrate the amount of uh, air intake so that it performs better. It, you can look at it that way. That is a way of looking at it, but that is not the way that we have been made or we're not made to be reduced to that. And so I, I have been working with this esoteric concept of the Christed mind and the Luciferic mind and that the Luciferic mind is the mind that seeks to know and that the Christed mind is the one that accepts how it is because it, that's how it was made. And so we're told that Christ is in our heart and in other spiritual traditions where we're told to bring our heart and mind into, uh, into a synchronous pattern. And another way that that can be said is bringing Christ and crowning him again, bringing him up into his throne, taking him out of the heart cave and bringing him up to remove the usurper. The usurper is the intellectual mind that seeks 
to define things through number, symbol, pattern. It's a great tool. It's a poor master. So it's a great servant for doing things out in the world, but is a poor master whenever it comes to taking care of you at, at a holistic level. And this is one of the things that I said whenever we were in the vibrant was the I that I am when I speak of myself is the I that you are when you speak of yourself from the subjective. It is the same consciousness subjectively perceiving itself. We just have these dif different filters of experience based on our life. And so to, for us to synchronize our lives together, that's basically what was going on at uh, the bear fest. And that's what goes on at a lot of these higher minded festivals where people aren't seeking inebriation, but they're seeking connection. They're not trying to get out of their bodies, but they're trying to get into their bodies. They're trying to communicate with other beings that are doing that really well. And so they're not so airy and that they're grounding themselves more or they're too grounded and they need to uplift themselves. They're, they're, there's different, different patterns for different experiences, but ultimately we're trying to remove doubt by going back into that intuition that is within ourselves. And a lot of times it's obscured through all of these worldly concepts that the creator looks at as, as folly. It's, and um, it, let a man that persisteth, persisteth in his folly shall become wise, like a fool that persists in his folly shall become wise. If you keep going, like eventually everyone gets the, enlightenment. Everyone reaches enlightenment. It's whether you're doing it while you're working here and you're still in this body, or it's at the time where you give your body back because the creator gave us this life and this body as a gift. And if we can live our life in such a just and harmonious way that we can give our life back to the creator as a gift, I, I've said it like this, like, don't feel like your life's being taken from you. Feel like you're giving it back. Feel like you're, you're doing the best that you can to just paint this beautiful picture for your father. And you're just, you're so excited to get him to put it on the fridge. Just I, hold on. I'm not done with the details. Let me, let me do this. And you're trying to make your life as beautiful for the creator because he made your life so beautiful. Anyways, he gave you the gift. He gave you all of the tools. And of course I'm using he, but the creator gave us all of these gifts so that we may experience at all because. And so it can experience through us. Exactly. Yeah. And There's so many and, terms that we can trip up on like Luciferic or Christ. And like, then all of a sudden people have their idolatrous beliefs about what those words mean. But I, I would love to riff on that with you a little bit, because that's a very interesting perspective that I totally totally get where you're going with that uh, in terms of like just that word lucifer uh that you know when you dig into the esotericism and symbolism to on a syncretism level you find out that the actual true symbol of lucifer if you will or like the original intent of the the meaning of the symbol lucifer is going to tie back to venus the morning and evening star which is your phi <laughs> which is the pattern that life is in and like you said this there's this part of our mind, this pattern recognition aspect of mind. That's kind of what mind is. It's like a kid that wants to play a game and that game is pattern recognition. And if you don't tell it what pattern recognition to, to program itself to find what game to play, then it, it tends to default to like this sort of external. And maybe this is more just a condition that humanity is currently in in society, but it tends to sort of auto program itself to, looking for external patterns of like, what has the most power? What is the greatest? <laughs> what is yeah. the Messiah? What is the savior? And Lucifer, that word, it means light carrier, light farrier, lux fere. So the word itself has nothing evil in it on a vibrational tone. But what happens over time is that like humanity loses touch with what ancestors meant by symbols and by myths and then becomes idolatrous with the, and I mean, like literally fetishizes things and <laughs> totally misses the point and turns, uh, you know, makes gods out of out of statues, if you will, metaphorically or, or external false things. So, you yeah, have the, this pattern the, recognition. The golden, Buddha, the golden Buddha has clay feet. <laughs> you could never. Yeah, you could. 
you could like go around and be like Luciferian. A lot of the truth community does that points at things and calls it Luciferian says it's evil. Or you could instead try to merge and recognize that this Christ figure in the mythology that is a Mercury or a Gemini character, also a Hermes character, a Thoth character, that this same force or the same symbolic or mythological representation of the one life force energy that is the eye behind all the eyes, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that that is what we're talking about when we discuss a, a concept like Christ on the true deepest esoteric level or Odin or Hermes, that it's the one, the being, being yeah. itself. So that also tying into the heart, the heart is the observer of everything. And that's why the, the one, the being, the Christ is depicted with the heart is in the heart. It, it symbolically is the heart and bringing it to the throne, as you said, would be basically directing the pattern recognition of this Luciferic mind you're talking about, this thing that's trying to analyze and break things down and find the constituent parts and see how it all links together. Programming that part of mind to the pattern recognition of logos or the pattern recognition of the actual, <laughs> the potter, the father, you know, bingo. Yeah. And that's the, the beauty is when you actually have the mind programmed to that game, then you just see nothing but synchro syncretous unity of all life and you know, you, you start to discover things like the doctrine of signatures. That's something I wanted to ask you about. Is that you familiar with the doctrine of signatures in? No, I'm not. So there's this concept that when you talk about like herbalism is a perfect example, or just pl the plant world, that things that have a certain structure, vibratory frequency of color, or, you know, pattern to it, back to the pattern, mm -hmm. how that relates to a pattern that you can see within your body will inform you as to what that herb or plant is good for, for health reasons or for medicinal purposes. Like you see something that has this dendritic uh, pattern of, you know, branching, forking, almost like blood veins in the body. You could guess that that's something that's good for the blood, right? Mm -hmm. Or something that is shaped like a kidney, like a kidney bean, they call them kidney beans, probably has something good to do with your kidneys or carrots that you slice it and you look at it, you can see sort of a circle in a circle, like an eyeball and carrots are good for your vision. So I was wondering if there's any doctrine of signature stuff that you could point out with mushrooms in terms of how it maybe resembles something in the body that also ties to its function with the body. But mushrooms are a little bit special because they have this adaptogenic quality, but mycelial yep. networks themselves do mirror the nervous system in a big way. So mm -hmm. I bet you got a lot to riff on with all this stuff I just laid down. <laughs> so totally, like, man. Totally. Uh, so as you just touched on, like the nervous system stands out as one of the more obvious ones. One of the things that I like to introduce to people is whenever you are growing mycelium on a Petri dish, it's, it's an easy way to observe it because you have it isolated on a dish and you can observe the growth. or in one of these bags, it's just hardwood sawdust and the mycelium of whatever mushroom uh, culture that we're growing. The way that it grows is radially symmetrical, accounting for any obstacles in the environment. So what that means is radially symmetrical is all directions at once at the same, at, at the same growth rate, radially symmetrical. So what is done to one side is done to the other side at the same rate. And then it accounts for obstacles. So if there is an obstacle in the environment, you may start to see a growth pattern that looks a little bit wonky because they're growing around something. And it's a very fluid movement. And it's like watching, um, watching water move slowly through something. It's, it's very interesting to see the flow of it. It is also mycelium is the body of the mushroom. So a lot of, uh, and it's the body of the fungus because people think of fungi and they think of a mushroom. It's, it's the easiest thing to think of, but there are basidiomyocetes, which make a mushroom. And then there are uh, ascomyocetes, which make more of like a spore um, than they do make a full fruiting body. And they can have like microscopically, it looks like a fruiting body. Like you can look at it, but it's really um, a, a different structure that will have a bunch of spores all over it. And 
those are like molds and mildew. These, these form more of that type of, um, of structure. And then you can also have dimorphic uh, fungi. And these are things like candida. Candida yeast is a, is a dimorphic yeast that can exist in a mycelial form, but it can also exist in a spore form. So it's really interesting because spores are like an egg for all intents and purposes for fungi. And that egg is very resistant to environmental changes and is persistent. So they are temperature, um, they're, they're temperature resistant. They can be chemical and physical, re physically resistant as well. So these spores can persist in the environment for a very long time. And we've only had advanced microscopy for the past like hundred years to be able to see these at all. But we don't know how long they can exist in an environment. So they could be in the sands in the Sahara and they're just waiting for the right environmental stimuli to come alive. Otherwise they're waiting. They're waiting for their time for their key in, uh, the orchestra of of nature and of their ecosystem they're waiting for the wand to wave and introduce them onto their ecosystem and so these are existing outside around inside of us all times and <clears throat> whatever we're putting on our bodies or in our bodies has a has a profound effect on our biome as well as the biome in our local environment, ecosystem, culture, home, whatever you want to call it, your neighborhood. And so we see a lot of people are using glyphosate, using a lot of endocrine disrupting chemicals, using uh, persistent herbicides, pesticides, and all of this stuff just so that they can keep their concrete looking crisp and clean throughout the year. And it, it's poisoning the whole neighborhood. You're poisoning the well, like just for appearance, j just for it to look like nice straight lines. Um, and even curves. If someone's got a, if someone's got a nice, long, luxurious, curvy driveway. Um, and the fungi are actually capable of dealing with a lot of these environmental toxins. It's a good thing. And it's, kind of a double-edged sword because if you're getting into fungi and you're like, oh, I see some fungi grow. I see a mushroom growing in my neighbor's front yard. I want to go pick it. And everyone wants to know if you can eat it. And it's, it's weird because uh, <clears throat> Kyle and I were uh, at Tippet Canoe Herbs. We were talking about how people have this almost extractive mindset, this um, transactional mindset about interacting with nature that they're like, oh, what, what's it good for me for? And he was talking about how he likes to speak with people about the virtues of a plant, not the uses. And so he can- That instead, guy is on another level. Such a great dude. He took me on a nature walk now. after the bear fest. He came and visited me where I live and uh, oh, nice. I learned so much. He's dude. just literally an encyclopedia of herbs. Anyway, I just had to shout out Kyle, dude. He's the man. Shout out to Kyle. Big love, big energy. Thank you, thank you, thank you, brother. And so we were talking about how people are looking at nature as a transactional thing and not as a relationship. And because we're so, again, because of the mechanistic view of things, we have taken our relationship and, form, and formed it into something that it really isn't. Um, it's, it's not pieces and parts. And so in the environment, these, these mushrooms can be breaking down these highly toxic materials that if we ingested it, we'd either become extremely sick and have a, a, to a, a detox process or it could kill us. Um, but these mushrooms can take it and uh, reduce inorganic materials into an organic state so that it can be further degraded in the environment. But if we interrupt that pattern, because we already did by spraying it into the environment. And then a mushroom comes along and starts cleaning it up. This is kind of where the terrain theory starts to come in. It's like we change the terrain by monocropping a, a, a lawn and then spraying it and fertilizing it and all this crap just so that it stays 
looking nice. Keep, keep up appearances, keep up with the Joneses that those mushrooms are coming to remediate the environment. They're coming to clean it up. And yeah, they're on that side of the soil so that we can stay on this side of the soil, <laughs> you know, they're helping yeah. us stay in the groove and out of the grave. They're doing so much. Dude, that's, that's great. That's, <laughs> that's great rhetoric. Um, and so if we interrupt that cycle by going to consume that and we're not paying attention to the fact that these soils are highly degraded and that they've been sprayed and, and made toxic, then we put that toxin in us because that mushroom still has it in its body and it hasn't put it back out into the, uh, into the microbiome to continue the degradation process. Because people have, um, people have this perception of plastics and I get it. Uh, pl plastics are something, it's a, it's a new hydrocarbon. It's a new carbohydrate that, the, that a lot of uh, biological systems, ours in particular, because we're really self-centered, um, that we haven't fa figured out how to use that carbohydrate for energy, except to just burn it as, uh, to, to burn it and turn a turbine, to, tur a turbine so that we can fuel uh, the electrical grid or something like that. That's, that's our biggest thing that we've come up with, with oil and petroleum derivatives. Um, but there are fungi that can eat plastic, that can, that recognize it as a carbohydrate. And they're like, okay, well, I'm going to have to like start playing with my enzymes. Enzymes mediate all the reactions in our body. They're specialized proteins that have to have a specific substrate to break down. So uh, keeping it simple, there are enzymes that break down sugars and they only break down sugars. They're not going to interact with proteins to break down protein. So there are ones that break down protein and those that break down protein only break down protein. So there are yeah, different the, kinds of why pasteurized milk is not easy to digest is because of those enzymes that are natural to it are not there to assist you doing that. And denaturing protein. Whenever you change the pH or the temperature of an environment, you change the structure of that enzyme and you change the structure of the protein structure determines function. If it's not in the same form that it was from nature and you put it into back into nature, nature's like, wait, what are we doing with this? Like this, uh, it's, it's causing inflammation in your gut. And now you're gassy and now you call it lactose intolerance, but it's really the fact that you changed the fundamental structure of the proteins in the milk by boiling it. You, you change uh, instead of like just simple, it, maybe it has a W shape and then you bend it out of shape and now it's got a U shape and your body's looking for a U shape enzyme to break down the protein and it's not finding it. So it starts causing inflammation because it doesn't know what to do with it. So instead it's like diarrhea, get it out of the body, get it out of here as quickly as possible. That's, that is that's the other fascinating thing about microbes or microbiology is the, and cellular biology is how everything comes down to this geometry aspect of like, what is it literally yeah. shaped? Like there's locks and keys. The whole thing is kind of structured that way. And so yeah. it brings about the whole notion of cymatics to a way higher level of importance. And with sound, I've thrown this out there before, but it's actually been demonstrated that with sound, your cells of your body will restructure their membranes as if they were t uh, taking in some sort of a, uh, a chemical that had a certain effect, like part of the effect of anything we eat is that if your cells want to take it in, they restructure their cellular membrane so that whatever it is can fit through it like lock and key and yeah. sound and vibration and electricity can actually cause those cellular changes without the substance added. So it's pretty yeah. amazing. And, and that's, there's some pretty deep, uh, so, some pretty deep implications of that. If we choose to start exploring that and we start, is there's, there's some people that want like a raw food diet. That's not necessarily the best. Like there are things that should be eaten raw and there are things that shouldn't because they may contain a lot of anti-nutrients that bind minerals and make them less available to your body. And uh, minerals like, um, we'll just go with electrolytes like sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, these things, and, and zinc, zinc's a very important one. Zinc and magnesium, are responsible for over 1200 enzymatic uh, uh, relationships in your body. There are cofactors in these enzymes, which means you don't have enough of it. It's not going to work. So 
<clears throat> excuse me, I was talking earlier about temperature and pH determine the um, can determine the structure of a protein and enzymes are specialized proteins that break down things in, in the body's environment. So there's also another thing that determines the efficacy of these enzymes is substrate, the amount of substrate. So the amount of stuff that they're able to break down and then cofactors. So you, you have these, the, these different determining, uh, characteristics that if they're not in place in the right proportions, then you're only going to have limited uh, catalyst reactions. So enzymes are catalysts to make reactions happen faster. So if you've ever eaten um, or if you've ever used a tenderizer for beef, it's usually got papain or bromelain. And those are enzymes that are derived from papaya and um, pineapple. And they break down protein. They are called proteases. They're specialized enzymes for breaking down protein. If you were to be chewing that piece of meat and then take a, a chewable form of that enzyme, you would notice that that piece of meat almost starts to like liquefy as you're chewing it and it doesn't stay as fibrous. And that's because of the action of these enzymes. That's what would go on in your gut. You have some proteases in your saliva, but it's mostly amylases. That's why whenever you put sugar on your tongue, it's gone. <laughs> it's because we've got all of these these enzymes in there that are great for breaking down sugar. Um, and most of the more complex stuff has to happen inside of our gut. Um, and, and so <clears throat> I'm kind of losing my track of thought there, but it's, it's very important for us to be, uh, be aware of our diet so that we're feeding ourselves the, the minerals that we need for these enzymes to function appropriately because these enzymes make hormones. These enzymes allow food to be further digested and made available for our microbiome and our microbiome makes hormones and these furnish our attitudes. Our hormonal system, our endocrine system is the physical representation of our chakra system. And so we, we have an organ that is correlated with each chakra and it is a gland. It secretes some sort of hormone and it has some sort of enzyme mediated synthesis that it's a part of as well. And it's important for us to take that into account whenever we're consuming anything. Media that makes you fearful, that makes your adrenals start to just pump cortisol and adrenaline, that starts to get your body in this fight or flight state. And Eventually, you can start to become numb to it and you don't even feel that it's happening, but it's happening. You know, what's and interesting, too, is that that's all correlated to the so solar plexus chakra. Mm -hmm. And that's the will. color yellow. So you're, you're putting yourself in this stressed out fear state, you know, and they say that cowards are yellow. <laughs> yellow bellies. Oh, what you're saying is radically true in a metaphorical way to understand the endocrine system and the glandular connection to chakras is that they're like the the base colors of your palette to paint your life picture that you talked about at the beginning and yeah. you know if you don't have a, a balance or you don't have all the colors then you're not going to have a full experience of the entire range of life right yeah but i want to i want to do a bit of a pivot here because we have let's do it we have enough time here. I want to just make sure in the first hour that we, we spend at least some time talking about your company and what you offer and <laughs> your, your mission with that. Cause of course we could just get into whatever gravy comes up naturally and we will continue that flow in hour two, but I want to make sure that we give people the rundown so that they feel encouraged to uh, look into what you do, support you, support themselves through the products that you offer and be inspired perhaps to take up, uh, at least a hobby or practice of mycology for themselves, because uh, I imagine that you can probably tell us about the journey to being able to provide at least some of your own uh, food and nutrition this way. And maybe not that hard of a process. Yeah. It's, it's very simple to grow mushrooms. It's harder to, uh, to do what we're doing for, um, for profit. Like we're, and we're not doing it for profit, but it supports our family. Like this is what I do. I'm a mushroom farmer. Um, and I also have chickens and goats and I grow food. 
but this is our stream of income. And I'm very grateful and extremely blessed that this is what I'm able to do because I enjoy it. I get up and I'm not going, Oh goodness, I'm going to have to go do this thing. No, I get to, I'm, I'm already at that semantic leap from got to, to get to, and I'm blessed. And so it feels uh, good, doesn't it? I love uh, being in that place. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's a play. It's, it's being blown out. It is Nirvana. Um, so what we do here is we grow powder, grow, dehydrate powder, uh, encapsulate and tincture all of our products here. Um, the, the wall that I'm facing right now is actually the wall of our laboratory that, and then behind us is our incubation space. And then we also, again, as I touched on earlier, we have a fruiting room over here and then we have an outdoor fruiting room where the outdoor fruiting room has most of our, uh, edible mushrooms. So in our lab, I work from tissue cultures and spores all the way to bringing about these final mushrooms. And so what we're really providing here is a chance for people to reconnect with the medicine that is almost certainly in their landscape. A lot of these mushrooms are widespread and uh, endemic throughout, uh, especially North America. But from uh, tropical up to temperate ranges, you can find most of these mushrooms. For me personally, doing this was about providing medicine. I watched my mom rely on uh, pharmaceuticals to no avail. She is still on pharmaceuticals. At one point, she was up to like 15 prescriptions a day. And at some, and at some point, I was able to have the conversation with her and sort of level with her to where she started to back off of some of them because it was having extremely negative effects. I wanted to be able to provide this because I had a very potent uh, psychedelic mushroom experience. I ate the mushrooms that, that God puts behind cows, man, they're, they're there for us. And it's, it's not inappropriate that they exist and they should not be demonized. They are a relational Makes organism. You wonder if that's where the idea of a sacred cow came from. Dude. But there's a lot of reasons why the cow is sacred. I mean, there's so, so much, yeah. <laughs> so much energy between them and us, but yeah, continue. And so I had this powerful mushroom experience that told me to do what I'm doing. And Call it what you will. You That's can, how it, I wound up here too. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, the mushrooms connected us, right? And so that's that seems to be their role is that they are connecting these niches in environments as much as the at the micro level in the soils and in the um, and in the environment to the macro level at the societal level. Uh, if you read any of Terrence McKenna's work, he said that we ventured from uh, a, a societal type that had these mushroom ritual initiations to bring about manhood and uh, a coming of age, not necessarily just manhood, but a coming of age process for the people of that society. And then it shifted from that and it, into one of alcohol and people started to consume alcohol and they started to imbibe the spirits more than to connect with this already. Like it doesn't require us to do anything to it. You just literally pick it and eat it. <laughs> um, and I used I to have like been. mediumship experiences on psilocybin where Terrence McKenna would like call me on the mind phone and I would just uh -huh. hear like giving me a lecture in my, in my head. It was, yeah. It's yeah. And, and, and like giving guidance and it's like, where does the guidance come from? Like, I don't get bad uh, messages, but I do, ha I have had difficult experiences, which was uh, shifting my personality structure. My ego was too bent out of shape and I had to get tink, 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 straightened on the, I had to get straightened by fire. It's, I, I had to be straightened on the anvil. I had to be put between a rock and a hard place to get straightened out. And it, it feels like a death because it is a psychological death that has to occur that you see how intangible your, um, your ego structure is, your personality structure. And so when you have that experience too, whenever you finally let go into it or whatever happens and the ego death occurs and then you're like, 
oh, I remember who I am. I remember what all this is. And you almost like, the only way to describe it in words is that you touch or become aware of the original vibration that all the other vibration is eminent from. <laughs> so, yeah. hard, so hard to describe, but like there's Dude, a way like to you- feel the vibration of what, what all this is and uh, the cyclical nature of it occurs to you and you're like, oh, I've been here before. Sometimes I forget and I go on this long trip and the real trip was the trip between then and this moment of remembering what I am. The mushroom Mm -hmm. trip isn't the trip. The trip is this forgetting stage. (laughs) And uh, Eventually you can get to a point where you kind of like, even if you don't have the feeling of touching the original vibration, you know about it, you know it's a thing and you're not tripping anymore. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And, and it makes the real stand out as, as being more real. Um, the relationships that you have with your family, the relationship that you have with yourself, these become more real and they become less abstract. And like you said, you kind of find that you're just the pinky on the hand on the arm of the being that makes the whole thing move and do its thing at all. But you're like, wait, that's me. I'm the pinky. Okay, cool. Like I found, oh, wait, I'm a part of a bigger pattern. Oh, that pattern's really big. You're the bud (laughs) off of the Buddha. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. The Buddha tree. You're a bud on it. And so um, just to kind of touch on what we do with our business, like we make medicinal mushroom extracts. We make medicinal mushroom powders. This is what's available through our website and uh, mushroom grow kits. And we are, we're we're a really small operation. Like I look at what we have here and then I look at some other larger operations and I'm like, whoa, you guys are like busting tail to make that happen. Like I'm busting tail to make this happen. So I know that that's, um, so I know that that's challenging to be able to do that. So be patient with us. If you do choose to support us, like we we're doing, uh, we work every single day and we, strive to provide the highest quality medicine with the tools that are at, uh, that are at our disposal. And so I, uh, following us on Instagram, you can get a really good insight as to what we're doing behind the scenes. You can kind of follow along a little bit more of the philosophy that we're, that Chance and I are uh, having a little back and forth about here. And you can see that what we're doing here is we have a, a much larger holistic picture. We're not just trying to, I'm not trying to sell you on anything, man. Like I sell stuff. That's what I do, but I'm not trying to sell you on it. Like I do more than just, I'm not a salesman. I was a salesman at one point in my life. I worked for a large uh, supplement retailer and it got me into herbalism and it got me into a lot of uh, studying um, natural remedies and things like this. But I also saw that while I was working there, people were again being devalued into dollars and cents and not into, uh, not, not into the spirit that's in them. And I, I actually pretty much got terminated, uh, from a managerial position for seeing that and trying to help people. And apparently that wasn't my position to help people is to make that corporation money. Um, yeah. And so, and so I already, like our family is plenty supported by our community, but if you choose to support us, what you're getting into is a relationship. Like we try to provide you with what, what you are asking us about. Like I have a lot of people that ask me, Hey, this is what, these are my symptoms. This is my symptomology. How can, how can you provide something that helps? Um, we only have one tincture right now. It is a five mushroom extract. It has chaga, reishi, lion's mane, turkey tail, and shiitake. These are all, um, they, they all support your immune system. They all help with uh, detoxification. They all help with uh, reducing inflammation. Inflammation is the root cause of disease. If you want to look at it from an Ayurvedic standpoint, we inflame ourselves um, and we have to put out the, the, the fires within ourselves or calm or quell or direct the fires within ourselves. Um, and a lot of our inflammation is in our gut because of our diet. And so mushrooms are great for detoxifying that. Uh, we have grow kits that you can grow your own edible mushrooms like oyster mushrooms. Those are great for detoxifying your gut. And uh, I, I call it like it's, it's like a big gentle brush for your colon. And it's, it's great to just be consuming those and keeping those 
in rotation in your life. Um, get out and forage and connect with your land that, that you're on. Connect with it. That way you can find the patterns of time to consume these mushrooms that grow locally as well because they'll start to furnish a particular niche in your microbiome as well. And it, it's very important to interact with them. Um, but that, that pretty much wraps up like what we provide here. I also do some consultations. If you listen to other uh, podcasts that have been on like Pro Triple Seven Radio, I spoke about mushrooms a lot, uh, really in depth in episode 386. Recently, my wife, Elise, and I, she spoke about being a birth keeper. And I spoke about being a death sitter and just be bearing witness for people. And that kind of touches a little bit more of the philosophy side. I have a lot of people talking to me about cancer. And if whoever has cancer is not willing to address it at the spiritual level, then there's not a whole lot that I can do by providing you material aspects to quell that spiritual problem, that spiritual inflammation. There's a lot there to unpack. And I'm also excited to talk to Elise in the future about the birth keeper stuff. There's so much overlap with the esoteric or the metaphysics of what we've discussed on episodes past with birth sorcery, if you will. Mm -hmm. But James, we're at the hour. So in the second hour, I'm going to definitely want to know more about some of those mushrooms that you cultivate on an individual level and your relationship to each of them. It's been a really great conversation so far, man. Thank you for bringing all this knowledge and enthusiasm. Yeah, of course. Not the enthusiasm, and that's the key. You know, it's mm -hmm. like what we say is back to that material and spiritual dynamic. Like what we say, the material of it will only be as useful as the spirit that we bring to it. And what people really come to this type of thing for that we're doing right now is for the energy. And <laughs> with mm -hmm. us, I'm, I'm sure people are feeding on a spiritual nourishment level of like, this is good energy. This is health, healthful energy, as opposed to some of the content out there on the internet where people are going just to feed that sort of cortisol adrenaline addiction. So yeah, excited to get into it an hour or two, man. Thank you so much for being here. Cool. Thanks for being a friend. This has been awesome. See everybody on the other side. Thanks for listening, everyone. Yo, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to a great episode. They always are, but I like it a lot more when I actually know the person in the real world meat space. <laughs> Maybe you call it uh, mushroom space. <laughs> yeah, I had much fun with this conversation. Uh, he, James is a fun guy. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Those are like such low hanging fruit. They're not even good enough for dad jokes. Anyway. I hope you guys also enjoyed the conversation. And as always, the second hour goes deeper. There's more info. It is super worth your time, super worth your five bucks a month. If you go the Patreon route or $10 for the Rockfin side. But remember, if you do the Rockfin side, you get access to all the Primo content on the entire network. You can just basically leave behind Cuties Flicks or Disney's Plus or whatever, any of those dumb streaming services that support Terrible, terrible societal programming. And I say support it. They are the programming, <laughs> literally. So Rockfin, pretty good call. Or my Patreon gets you a cool RSS feed link that allows you to plug it into your podcast player of choice, which means you can get the audio versions of the show in the premium feed and you don't have to go anywhere else other than where you would normally be doing your podcast from. All of that is possible. Uh, thanks again to James and I'm really looking forward to talking with his wife, Elise, about the birth stuff because we have covered off much of the occult aspects of the birth sorcery, you know, bait and switch that goes on to generate the corporate personhood and bind people to a social contract that they really didn't actually have the ability to give consent to. Uh, but the practical side of giving birth, obviously, uh, I'm a man, and I know in 2022, there may be a pregnant man emoji, but I know nothing about giving birth. I, my body isn't even capable of it, despite what, <laughs> despite what society is currently being made to believe. Anyway, all that's going to be awesome. 
the second hour with James. Oh, for sure. Go support them with some of their products, you know, familyfungi.net, really easy, or you can find them on Instagram. James is also in our Telegram chat. You can uh, communicate with him directly through there if you give a at tag brother nature bear. So second hour of this conversation, we got into uh, mushrooms and coffee, how those things play together. Chaga, Bert. Oh yeah, this was interesting. Chaga and birch trees and the special relationship between them. Um, as Maybe that's like a little sampler of all the different interesting gravy that there is to be applied between like what mushrooms grow and what type of trees. And then we have occult correspondences with trees. So does that mean we can maybe, you know, shift or apply those correspondences of the tree to the fungi that like to grow on said tree? I don't know. That's like a whole unopened can of worms as far as I'm aware. Talked about mycelium as opposed to the fruit body of the fungus and the differences between that and how that works medicinally, like using the mycelium, which is the under the ground part and using the fruit body and how, you know, the difference there, that's interesting. And the synergy there, we got into a good um, flow about adaptogenic mushrooms, what it means that they're adaptogenic. And then we moved into some other topics like self massage and the lymphatic system, which is not really fungi related, but it was a fascinating thing to discuss, no doubt. Uh, the, we talked about forming an ecology of personal health and spirit practices. I like that. I used to call it a constellation of practices, but an ecology of practices is cool too, because like ecology, sometimes, you know, some of it's not there and then it comes back later in the cycles of nature and our practices for health and spiritual development can be the same and we don't have to beat ourselves up if we fall off one, but we pick up another. It's just like the flow of the ecology, right? Uh, we talked about cheap building materials and harmful home molds growing from local spore cultures. His whole I like where and how he's able to grow from things that are actually local to his area. That's cool. Uh, the terrific traits of turkey tail and also the way that nature is giving us information and signaling us that it's time to take certain mushrooms at certain times of the year. All that and a lot more, but that's, you know, the rundown of the plus extension. If you're interested in that information, please join us by getting into the uh, Patreon or the Rockfin side. <laughs> and, you know, as we talked about a bit, James and I met physically at the Bertaria meetup in Missouri, which I was so blessed to be able to go to only an hour drive away that I actually came and went. I know this is going to sound lame, but I didn't even camp. <laughs> I just came home afterwards and uh, spared family members from having to come take care of my cats and uh, slept in a bed. So it was kind of selfish and helpful to others at the same time. And Bertaria was a blast. I could say a lot about it, but uh, I tended to hang around the same group of people most of the time, although I met lots of people, but I found myself like really magnetized and attracted to hanging around James and Elise, his wife. And right next to them was the booth for Tippecanoe Herbs, which had Kyle and Serena, the awesome, awesome Kyle and Serena. We'll be talking to Kyle here soon, probably in a vibrant before long as uh, one of the panel. And then you know, he'll definitely have his own episode coming up. That guy knows his stuff. He gave me an herb walk. I got to learn all about the different herbs of the area and their virtues. I love that he calls them virtues rather than uses. This guy gets it. <laughs> Typical new herbs. And uh, also spent a lot of time with the man Topher. Everybody was wanting his attention and his gravy and he's so full of it. Uh, we'll have him back on soon to maybe see if we can capture some of the magic of what he was ladling at the bear fest because I was enwrapped with his ideas and I love that guy. He's a good friend. Uh, so all in all, it's just beautiful. Anytime that there's a festival where there are children and dogs like running around free and it's not a problem and nobody's worried about it, you know, you're in a good place. And this was one of those places. In fact, I have never seen so many kids or dogs at what you would call a festival. This practically needs its own name that is separate from the idea of like music festivals and people partying and getting wasted and all of the things that go on at those that are less than ideal for the, uh, you know, expansion of consciousness and the generation of synchronicity. This was pure synchronicity, the whole thing. I had a really fun time checking out some of the craft vendors and it was a smaller event. So I hope that next year they allow more of that. 
th- this is not like a complaint, but <laughs> it's just a fact. <laughs> I, I I put in an application to do a booth there and I uh, never heard back from my application. So I just bought a ticket and went, you know, normal style. And I was able to do some tunings for people. And I had a little table out and I sold a couple of posters just to have sort of a station where people could come to me. And it was awesome to meet some of you out there who are listeners to Interverse. That was always, it's always a pleasure whenever like, instead of me telling you about what I do, you already know and you're stoked on it and we can like, talk about the things that the show is about. And I love that so much. But in terms of me turning in an application, uh, I was told that my tuning stuff was not considered because of concern that like more biblical uh, religious people, more by the book people, whatever that means, would be, they were concerned that it would be seen as blasphemous and I just found that a little funny and I'm not like salty about it at all. In fact, running a booth and trying to do like full-time tuning was never what I wanted. I kind of just wanted like the permission to have a space to uh, talk about it and teach people about it. Cause I'm very much over anything else interested in getting as many people into the modality as possible. So if you're like out there and you know, the bear community seems ideal for this, in my opinion, if you're out there and you maybe are part of that community too, I would love to see people like learning and picking up how to use the forks and sharing that skill with each other so that more of us are doing it because there's like, you can't do it too much. And it's magic, man. I mean, not magic with a K or like magic, like, I don't know, shooting lightning at your fingertips. But to me, it is the least blasphemous thing in the world to (laughs) align with, uh, with, tone and sound that is coherent and harmonious and allow your body to do what it does. Cause it's very much like, at least in terms of comparing it to Christianity, kind of like a faith-based healing in a way, because your intent about what you're doing and also to a large degree, your belief has a lot to do with how the process will go for you. But then on the other hand too, you're actually like in a tuning, it's altering your beliefs in a positive way, because part of the process is going back and finding through the biofield, your energy field, which is a structure based on your thoughts. I mean, structure is even a bad word for it, but it is ba- this biofield is based on your thoughts and what you believe about yourself. And a lot of times we set beliefs about ourselves a long time in the past. Like maybe you're 11 years old and your parents are like, you're so lazy. You're so lazy. And they're just really beating you down with that label. And you know, not, to say everyone's parents did that or that if they did, that makes them bad parents. These things just happen. And we don't necessarily always realize when and where we don't even remember that that was happening. And we internalize that label at that time of our life. And it actually just kind of haunts us forever until we do something about it. We go back, think of like on technology, right? Technology gets more and more complicated. Some things have tons of settings and Maybe when you first get the device, you go through and look at all the options and you set a few of the settings, but you don't really know what's ideal because you don't know the device that well. And then as you go on, like maybe it's a few years later and you never really check the settings again, or you forgot that there was the option to do something differently. So you have certain settings about your, your beliefs about who you are and what you are that occasionally can get set and then forgotten. And you forgot that you even set it to that. And now that's the default you're running on and it's basically another convoluted way of saying unconscious, <laughs> but that's the metaphor that I use. And with the tuning, we can find those and we can change them consciously by going, no, I'm not that. I don't really believe that about myself. This is what I want to be now. This is who I know I am. And you have now been able to go back and alter your beliefs and enhance your faith. <laughs> you know, it is a faith-based thing in a lot of ways, the tuning. So uh, all that being said, if you guys want to get in on one with me, please hit me up. It's looking like October is going to be a narrow month for booking because, and there's already a lot booked in September. There's still some room in the latter part of September, but I have a big trip to music and sky festival coming up in October, which I'm sure you've heard me talk about, but if you are interested in all at all and going to join us at Kuyama Valley in Southern California on the weekend of October 13th, please get your tickets and use chance 50 as a discount code to get 50 bucks off and see you there. It's going to be awesome.
and I'm going to be on that trip and I have a few things planned on the front and back end of it, definitely the back end. So it's not going to be, I'm going to be off for a while. I'm taking a break during that time. So I won't be able to do tunings for people. And if you want to make sure you get on my schedule for sooner than later, then do it sooner than later. Email me chance at interversepodcast.com. I love hearing from you guys. I love doing these from people all around the world. I had one with somebody from Belgium today. That was fantastic. Super fascinating. All kinds of people come to me for tuning. And what's interesting, you know, all age groups, all, all genders, <laughs> all two genders. <laughs> and what's cool is how the more I do it, the more I see that we're more alike than we are different. And that although our life stories are unique and the paths we take constitute a melody that's different from individual to individual, that melody is composed of the same seven notes or that painting of your life story and what you are and who you are is made painted with the same seven colors. And there are shades of those colors and there's the light and the dark and all of that, but it's a really good process. I'll just stop rambling about it now. And I also want to say, I love this conversation with James because of the practicality of growing your own food and any conversation that is turning us towards solutions that are radically helpful and accessible. Those are the, probably the highest value conversations. Uh, interestingly, not the highest viewed conversation. So if you enjoyed this, please spread it around and help make sure that more people find out that this information exists and get it out there. And I just wondered a long time ago with mushrooms, like I think one of the first times I ever had a psychedelic mushroom experience, I was standing in this river and looking up at the trees and I was all of a sudden I was like, who's growing who here? Like we think of ourselves as the stewards and cultivators of the realm, but like, are we sure that the trees aren't growing us? <laughs> like they have a lot to say about our experience in the environment. Uh, and not just the trees, but the trees are connected into the mycelium networks and they are all communication network and the whole environment. So anyway, it was just a sort of stoner moment of realizing, wow, we think that we're the masters of nature, but nature is and always has been what's guiding what we do and is trying to help us at all times. It seems like to me. So I'm going to play us out with a tune by pure colors called Ascension. 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 It's got an accent mark over the O pure colors and soul food horns. I love pure colors. That guy is an awesome music producer. So I hope you enjoyed the episode. Hope you share it with a lot of people. Hope you join interverse plus and get the second hour. I hope you're having a great life. I'm full of hope. <laughs> I love my life. Everything's going awesome. Like all kinds of things are going awesome. I only thing that was tough was I think I had a gravy overdose and got the sniffles after Bertaria. But anyway, I took care of that. So love you all. Enjoy this track. And uh, thanks for tuning in. And I'll see you guys on the next one. Peace be unto you.